if you get to two minutes and 39 seconds, they're still like, <gasps> okay, I guess it's time to go do another set. Like, no, it's not, motherfucker. You are not ready. Your cardio is not ready. What are you doing? Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. I think tracking your rest times might be a bad idea on the net balance in most cases. Uh-oh, but what? that's crazy. We need to keep track of our rest times between sets, but then we know all the things and the numbers. You will notice if you are using the RP Hypertrophy app that as of the following of this video, at least, we do not have a rest timer in the app. There is also no plan to install one. In earlier hypothesized versions of the app, we had a rest timer as something we were going to make, and we ended up steering away from it, and I want to tell you why and whether or not use the app, why it might not be the best idea for you in most cases to track your rest times between sets. But first, let's talk about what the benefits could be and might be of tracking your rest times between sets. I can think of at least two things. First, tracking your rest times between sets can keep you on task because sometimes if you don't track your rest times, you have a tendency to scroll on your phone, flirt with the girls, flirt with the guys, flirt with grandma, flirt with grandpa, get yourself into orgies, you know, typical gym stuff. And five, seven, or eight minutes later, you still haven't done your set. If you had a rest timer every two minutes, every three, it would be like, hey, idiot, go back to work. So in that sense, it can be very helpful. It also can help in a related way of letting you know roughly how long you need to rest. Because if last week, you know, you leg pressed and you rested sort of two or three minutes between sets, this week, if you're now getting to three minutes and 30 seconds on your timer, you're like, all right, uh, time to get back to work. So it can really ground you in that sense. And that's a good thing. In addition to that, it can let you use a variation, a training modality, where you intentionally constrain yourself to a certain amount of rest. It's totally fine to do curls and then put the dumbbells down and rest until you're ready to go. Or it's totally fine to say, okay, I'm going to take 15 seconds or 30 seconds between every set of curls for the next six sets. And that way I build up a lot of metabolites. It's kind of like my rep in a certain sense. I'm just constraining myself to rest times. If for nothing else in variation, it's fun to do it's something different. And also, you know, it can drive a lot of metabolites. As long as I get a total number of reps, that's really high. It's going to yield pretty much the same growth that as resting longer will. You'll have to do more sets, but because you're only resting 30 seconds between sets and the reps in each set are a lower number, you end up doing the same amount of work, even it can allow you to constrain the time. So if you're time crunched and you're on a lunch break and you know, okay, I got to get all these sets done and I got to rest only 45 seconds between sets, it's going to be a great thing for you. So in those respects, rest time tracking, watching the clock can be really good. So I said the beginning of this video, I said, I don't think it's a good idea on the net balance which means I have more reasons coming up right now of why I think and when I think and how I think tracking arrest times leads you maybe astray of what you should be doing instead. First, there is no need for the data. You want to track your rest times. Let's say it's not just to give yourself a certain rest time as a different modality or because you're in a rush. In those senses, rest time tracking is great, but that's not how much tracking is, is like the rest time is a specific amount of time. And as soon as that time hits, you go again. Tracking means like you figure out how long that you're resting and you sort of write it down or the an app keeps track of it for you and you go, okay, this is how long I'm resting. What you really want to know during your rest break is, is it time to go again? And how much time that takes has nothing to do with if you're ready to go again. If you're ready to go again and have another productive set is based on the four-factor formula, the four-factor rest time model. We have like three other videos on YouTube about it, but I'll sum up what they say. And if you're curious, type in four-factor rest, Isratel, hit search on YouTube, and you'll find a few videos about it. Here's what the four-factor rest model says. You are ready to do your next hard set of any exercise if four things are true. One, you're not breathing heavy anymore. Your cardio will not be the limiting factor on the next set. Two, your neural strength, how you feel, how strong you are, are you capable, are you ready for another heavy set, feels good. Because like right after a set of curls, your grip feels weak, everything feels, uh. after a few minutes, you're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm ready to crush your shit out again. All right, check number two. Your synergist muscles are ready. 
So if you're doing a set of curls, you put it down and your biceps are healed after a minute, they feel totally fine, but your forearms are still shaky and really tired and really crampy. You're like, eh, all right, I'll rest longer because I'm not targeting forearms, but forearms are synergistic and I don't want forearms to be the limiting factor. Another good analogy here, or a good example rather, is if your lower back is still fried after a set of squats, you don't squat for your lower back, you squat for your quads. So if the situation is such that after two minutes of rest after squats, your quads are good to go, but your lower back is still fried, you got to wait longer because as a synergist, you don't want it to take the disproportionate amount of being the limiting factor. You don't want it a situation where you stop that next set because your lower back is really fried, even though your quads could have done more work because then as far as quad stimulus, they didn't get close to failure. Actually, just your lower back did. That's why you reacted. So they didn't get a good stimulus. So synergists have to be healed. And lastly, most of the time, we're doing sets of at least five repetitions in length because five reps have enough stimulus, enough volume. Five total repetitions is enough of a muscle growth signal that we count it as like a real hard working set. If you're doing sets of two and three, that's good for strength. But if you're resting so little that you're doing sets of two and three each time, dude, you're going to be doing like a hundred sets to get to your total rep goal. Rest longer, have higher quality sets of at least five repetitions or but even better, rest long enough that you get into the target rep range for what you want to do. So if you're doing lat pull downs and you're saying you're doing them for sets of 10 to 15 reps, if you did 12 on your last set, you go 30 seconds of rest, you can do like six. That's out of the rep range. You're targeting the mind-muscle connection will be all off. Nothing is going to be great. Your technique might be off because it's just way too much of a rush. If you rest for two or three minutes, you might be able to get a set of 10 or a set of 11. That takes you into that 10 to 15 range again in all as well. So just to recap, you are ready to do your next set when your cardio is good, when you're not breathing heavy anymore, when you feel strong again, when your synergists are cooled off and they won't be the limiting factor, and when the target muscle itself can do either at least five repetitions on the next set or as many repetitions as gets you into that target rep range you chose. This is when you know you're ready to go again. And I, was, I will illustrate in just a little bit, the time it takes doesn't matter because you know when you know when you know. A quick analogy, just to drive this point home, do you ever time how long on a road trip that you've been driving so that you know when to get gas? No. Why? Because you have a fucking fuel gauge for that. You know to get gas when it drops below a quarter tank or whatever. There's a gauge for that. You don't need another time. Someone's like, hey, how long have we been driving for? Do we need gas yet? You're like, what? Do you mean look at the fuel gauge and say yes or no? This is a thing. You could be driving for two hours, but it's like mostly downhill. And you're like, that. actually, we've been driving two hours, but we're like at more than half a tank. Or you could be driving two hours, but you're like crossing, you know, from Utah into Colorado on, on a road trip. And like, yeah, like you're down to an eighth of a tank and you should have pulled over fucking light years ago. And now you're going to be stranded in the middle of fucking Utah. And, you know, being in Utah at all is terrible. But stranded in Utah, even worse. I'm kidding, Utahians. Mormons, um, we're good. It's all jokes. So in any case, it's like if you have the four-factor rest time formula to tell you when to go again, and when it's not checked off all the four boxes, it doesn't matter what the time says, don't go. And when you have checked all four boxes, it doesn't matter what the time is. It's probably time to go. You get what I'm saying here. It's data that you don't need. Collecting rest times, nobody lost, nobody found. There's no reason to have them. Next, you say, okay, okay, okay. I still like to see how long this takes. I still like to collect my data. I have two problems with that. My first question to you is why? In sports science, really in all engineering style endeavors, you never want data that you don't use because collecting data, processing data, and storing data are all bandwidth eating. And you want as much bandwidth for doing important shit that actually works and actually makes a difference in your project or your goal or your endeavor, and you want to minimize clutter. Data stream clutter is what you're going to get if you collect rest times. It means you have to tell an app or a stopwatch like, hey, I, you're like here's the thing. You're done with a set of leg press. You, you're finished. You rack. You're like, oh, God. Oh, uh, uh, I got to click my shit. I got to put it down. Okay, okay. The rest time's gone. I'm going to look at it every now and again. What am I looking at it for? I don't fucking know. You should be looking at your breathing and your strength and your synergists and your target muscle. There's nothing you're going to see on that clock that's going to tell you anything you don't have to check back with anyway for how your actual body is feeling. And then 
before you're going on your next set, you need to be getting your mind right, cranking up that gang strap and your headphones. But instead, you're like, okay, time to hit the rest time and put that away. And then I go, why? It's clutter. The data stream is clutter. The data collection is clutter. The act of actually collecting the data by clicking the fucking button is clutter. You need to focus on the task at hand and you need to forget and try to eliminate all of the extra noise. When you are collecting data for data's sake, you are not being a nerd. You're not being a scientist. You're not hashtag PubMed warrior. You're just doing something fucking stupid. And it makes you look smart because you're Mr. Rest Time. And you're like, oh, that guy's got to be real smart. Except if other smart people in there who know how to train are looking at you, they're going to be like, what's the clock for? You go, I'm just monitoring my rest times, you know? I'll be like, no, I don't know. Can you explain to me what advantage? You're like, well, you know, I'm trying to keep things, trying to keep things organized. Why? Why? No, seriously, why? And you will not have a good response to that very likely because there may be no good response to that. Next, big problem. Why is there no good response? Point number three attends to one of the concerns. You need a different rest time between different types of sets. So the idea that you say to yourself, look, I'm going to rest two minutes between sets and that's my rest timer keeps me on track. This is already a problem. Remember, the four-factor rest time formula tells you when you're actually ready. And what that formula ends up summating to is different based on all kinds of different conditions. For example, set one to set two rest break. There's a bit of a shock there. Very high reps in the first set. Maybe you need three minutes to check all the boxes of the four-factor rest time so that you're ready to go again. Set two versus set three, you might be in the groove. Set two, you didn't do as many reps and your, your blood flow and everything's great. Maybe you need less rest. Maybe it was three minutes for set one to set two and then you're ready to go. Maybe it was two minutes and 30 seconds for set two to set three. So you're resting an extra 30 seconds for nothing because you assume the same rest times every time, but you shouldn't have done that. Between different sets, you guys will notice this. As you do a set, if you're doing the RIR method, reps in reserve, your first set will be like 15, your second will be like 10, then it'll be like eight and seven and six and six or something like that. The amount of rest you need between a set of six and a set of six is usually way lower than a set of 15 and a set of 10. For obvious reasons, you're not exerting as much cardiovascular demand. So your breathing never gets as heavy so that you don't have to wait for your breathing to come down. You're not, it's not, set of six is not as fatiguing as set of 15. So your neural drive is going to be back sooner. Your muscle is not going to be fatigued. The synergists aren't as fatigued. So a lot of times you need more rest for the higher reps and less rest for the lower reps if the weight is the same and you're just getting more tired. Or you have an interesting different response to fatigue and you actually need more rest between each set. Who knows? You never can tell unless you try. And if you've got a rest timer and you're like, I got it, there's two minutes between each set, you are needlessly decreasing the quality of some of the sets because you're not resting long enough. And you are needlessly increasing the time of the workout because you're resting too long for some of them. It's just a great way to get a lot of wrong answers. Next, different exercises for the same muscle group can demand a lot of different rest. Resting between sets of rows, three minutes maybe on average, on average. There's point number one there, the, the, the sets still vary. For pull downs, maybe a minute and 30, you're ready to go. Because pull downs, you don't have to brace yourself. You don't have to fight gravity. You just, it's just vertical only. There's not as much muscle being stimulated. So even if you say, okay, for back stuff, I typically rest three minutes. It's like, okay. Typically, though, isn't a formula. Typically means you're still some sets not resting enough, some sets resting too long. What about different muscle groups? Oh my God, this is totally nuts. When people say like, yep, I rest two minutes between sets. I have like uh, one of the rest time videos. There's a comment that came up early. It was like, don't watch this video. It's too long and boring. Just rest two minutes between sets. I swear to oh God, choke that guy to death. I'm kidding. But like that is a moronic fucking statement because if you train quads properly and it takes you two minutes to rest between sets of quads, does it take you two minutes between sets of biceps? Are your biceps as systemically fatiguing and draining as your quads? If so, you have the biggest fucking arms in the world and the smallest, most pathetic legs. You got like Harry Potter legs and Rich Piana's arms and some shit like that. In almost every case, quad and glute and back training is going to fry you and you're going to need way more rest than between sets of calves or sets of biceps, sets of forearms, sets of triceps, even sets of delts. There are huge differences between sets, between types of exercises, and even between muscle groups. 
And so the question I have for you is how many different rest times are you going to keep track of? And there is an intelligent response to this. You say, well, I'm going to keep track of everything week to week to week because it, it is, is an auto saw self-solving problem at, you know, set one to set two, I have a rest time that I write down or I have an app that tracks it for me. Set two to set three, I have one and it's, you know, compares biceps to biceps, quads to quads, set one to set two, set one to set two in the next week. All right, fine. We got that solved. Totally. Here's where problem number four comes in. If let's say last week you took two minutes and 35 seconds after one set of leg press to be ready for your next set. You're using the four-factor rest model. You're just timing it. You're saying, okay, I'm ready to go up oh, 235. Okay, my app has noted that. Does this mean this week, set one of leg press, you need two minutes and 35 seconds again? Why do you have that number to stare at? Because inevitably, if you say, well, look, I don't actually want to stare at that number on the second week, it's like, the fuck are you collecting the data for? So you clearly, if you want an app to do this, sounds like I'm being very defensive, right? Clearly, if you want an app to do this, you're going to want the data like in the next week. Like well, last week after set one of leg press, I rest two minutes, 35 seconds. What is your brain going to do inevitably? Well, this time I need rest two minutes and 35 seconds, but hold on a sec. What if that violates the four factor rest formula? What if after two minutes and 15 seconds, you're fucking good to go? Do you still wait another 20 seconds? Sure. It's not a big deal, but if you're going to wait another 20 seconds, here's the real kicker. If you're going to use the four factor rest formula anyway, why the fuck do you even bother collecting the fucking data? Let me tell you guys about the RP Hypertrophy app. With over 28 preset programs already in the app, you can choose to make your own, you can modify an existing program, or you can just run the programs exactly as they were written by me personally. This app programs everything for you. Exercises, weights, sets, reps, frequency, the whole thing. After every single workout on every single week, the app adjusts to your unique parameters with every single input. We have over 250 exercises in the app with detailed video tutorial links to every single one. You never have to be confused about technique or form ever again. I'm guessing right now you're pretty interested in the app? Download the RP Hypertrophy app today. If you get to two minutes and 35 seconds, you're actually like, <gasps> okay, I guess it's time to go. Do another set. Like, no, it's not, motherfucker. You are not ready. Your cardio is not ready. What are you doing? And you're like, but it's two minutes and 35 seconds. Like, so what? That's just a fucking number you wrote down. Last week was last week. This is this week. You are using more weight this time. Things are different. Maybe you're mass gaining. Your cardio is not as good. Maybe you're cutting. Your glycogen is not as high. You're more fatigued. Who knows? In the end, the four-factor rest formula is the right answer anyway. It is the ecologically best answer. I think I made this analogy on another time. I was giving an interview about this. And so I was going to be very curt about this. It's, uh, it was, uh, I think, yes, yeah, was on um, uh, our RP podcast with Mr. Nick Shaw. There are all kinds of activities that if you time them and you try to compare your times week to week to week, it's going to be nonsense. Guy go, garbage in, garbage out. If you time how long it takes for you to make love to your significant other. And then the next time you make love, you're like, all right, here we go. Mm -mm -mm. And 37 minutes, hit it. I'm sorry. What if at 32 minutes, you guys both nutted like crazy and everyone smoking a cigarette in bed. You're like, I really should continue for another five minutes. She's like, you're right. You just have like dry, like, uh, you having fun? She's like, no. Okay. Time's a time. Diligence is diligence. Or you're at like, 36 minutes and 57 seconds. And it's like the most passionate shit of your life. And you're like, dude, we could do this for fucking hours. And then 37 hits and you're like, and we're done. Shelly was your name. You've been great. Here's the door. What? what? Who cares? Who gives a shit? Love making. I'm trying to be politically correct here. It's a code for anal. Love making takes as much time as it's going to take because there is a definitive start point in a definitive, very unequivocal endpoint. And both y'all nodded, we out, <laughs> mission accomplished. And it's gonna take a different amount of time based on about a trillion different things or based on nothing at all. It's just gonna be the situation as a situation. And you know everything you need to know about whether you're well on your way to hitting and whether you're done internally. You do not need a clock for this. Training 
is much the same way. You know that when you're done breathing heavy, when you're feeling nice and strong again, when you can do the synergists are not limiting factor and when your muscle is ready to go for at least another five reps or it's target rep range, you're fucking good. If you're not good yet, you need to rest longer for best results. If you're good, you don't need to rest any more time. You can arbitrarily, but why? It ends up being arbitrary. So at the end of the day, if you really think it through, yes, there are some compelling reasons to get some rest times going. If not just to ground yourself or build up the habit of taking the right amount of time. And as a beginner, you might benefit from some rest time tracking. And your coach says, it goes, two minutes between every set. You'll start to learn after a few weeks, like, well, I don't need two minutes after biceps. I need more than two minutes after quads. My coach says it's two minutes. That just builds kind of good habits for you don't float around and waste time or rush into the next set. Clients do both things. Once you are like a late beginner, mid beginner even, for sure an intermediate advanced, rest time tracking, not always, it's always nuanced, always shades of gray, but it's usually just data for data's sake and there's no good reason to collect the data or use the data. And because it's data and it occupies your cognitive stream to some extent and your work stream if you're clicking the timer on and off, it's actually a net negative because you're collecting data you do not need. Anyway, let me know if that makes sense. Let me know if you guys have any really compelling reasons because I'd love to hear from you about why maybe we could track rest times and ways in which they're good that I didn't talk about. Or let me know from your experience if you have some thoughts about like, well, actually, yeah, I used to track rest times and I realized it was just like a road to nowhere and it was fucking pointless. Um, let me know what you guys think. See you guys in the comments. RP Hypertrophy app, link below. And of course, our members area where nerd stuff like this is just a daily occurrence. See you guys there. Peace.